Hey guys, Professor Bill, Comic Book University. It's time for another Spotlight on Story. And I'm thinking that we should do one of my absolute all-time favorite Avengers stories called Avengers Under Siege. This is not Avengers Siege, which was, you know, like Marvel, Superhero, Civil War, Secret Invasion, and then blah, 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 blah. And eventually, uh, you know, through the Dark Avengers and everything, uh, Siege. No, no, no. This is not that. This is long before that. Early 80s. Jim Shooter was still the editor-in-chief. And these are absolute crazy good comic books where the Masters of Evil is reformed and they take over Avengers Mansion and some people die. I'm saying <laughs> this is a big deal. All right. Uh, this is actually happening not too long, like almost immediately before and somewhat during the um, uh, Mutant Massacre. So... I'm going to get a whole lot more, I hope, into all of these different stories, like how I think that events that are done nowadays are not the same as they were done back in the day, although they kind of are, although they really make them confusing. I'm going to get into all that good stuff after I get into who or which stories were actually made here, which stories were actually done here. So basically, we're going to be reading Avengers 270 through 277. However... After issue number uh, 274, you may want to consider reading Captain America, issue number 324, and Amazing Spider-Man, issue number 283. Um, then, after you read issue number 275 of the Avengers, consider reading issue number 16 of West Coast Avengers. Then you can read issue number 276 and 277. If you really, really, really wanted to, consider reading issue number 373, of the mighty thor all right just at your leisure at your leisure there's a couple other books that you can jump into also but we're gonna we're gonna try and stick to as much as we can i for one i'm gonna be telling you a little bit about what happens in all of those books all right and we're mostly gonna be talking about the avengers here so under siege uh oh all the people who are involved in this okay for the most part you can look to um jim shooter as being the editor-in-chief um uh, Roger Stern does the writing. John Buscema does the pencils. Uh, Buscema and Tom Palmer do the inks. It's, it's kind of all over the place. Colors, uh, uh, Christy Scheel, uh, 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 Jim Novak on the letters, and Mark Grunewald is the editor for most of these. Howard Mackey kind of shows up a little bit also. Anyway, so let's get talking about this freaking incredible story, and we're going to get into that right now. So issue number 270 of the Avengers. The Avengers have been dealing with um, uh, Kang in Limbo most recently. So a lot of what happens here has a lot to do with that, specifically two and three issues prior to what happened, you know, what's going on right now. Uh, Namor had just joined the Avengers and people were protesting. They've been protesting for days. Like, they're just not happy with this because Namor just recently led a, a march, um, a, the Atlantean march into New York City. And it's like, oh, we're going to take over some things and all sorts of crazy things going on. And people are like, no, this is not cool. But that's only half the protesters. The other side of the street are protesters against those protesters because these are the older crowd. This is like the World War II veterans and whatnot. Because mind you, this is early 80s that this is happening, mid to early 80s. So, you know, it's it's cool, like, the you know, younger generation where the World War II vets are still alive and they're like, hey, uh, you know, no, Namor is a war hero. And whatever he's done before, it's whatever, it's forgivable because he's a vet. You know, he, he fought with the invaders. He kicked butt. He took names. He helped us against the ally or against the Axis, the Axis power. So, no, no, he gets a mulligan. All right. He gets a redo. Um, while all this is going on, the, uh, the Avengers are talking about, hey, man, you know, we should have made a statement and things like that because we didn't realize that we were going to wind up being taken away into limbo and whatnot. But we had a chance to make a statement. We didn't. Now that we've been gone in limbo for, you know, three issues or so of comic books, now all of a sudden the world sucks. So we got to we got to try and get in front of this. We didn't get in front of this. We got to go and talk about this right now. Um, Wasp and Hercules, for the most part, have been having issues with each other. By that, I mean Hercules has issues with Wasp. Why? The Avengers have always had this thing where there's a rotating leadership. And 
this time uh, Wasp, Janet Van Dyne, happens to be the leader of the Avengers. She's the chairwoman as it stands. So they always rotate leadership because, you know, when push comes to shove, they're always trying to build each other up. They're always trying to help each other out. They're always trying to make sure that everybody gets to feel a certain uh, aspect of leadership so that they can all grow as individuals. Uh, it's fantastic. You know, and plus it doesn't get too stagnant this way and there's no power struggle. Or at least there shouldn't be. Unfortunately, you got to figure Hercules is this ancient example of mankind. You know, a lot of people question, you know, Jim Shooter didn't allow agendas to be pushed in comics before, but no, that's simply not true. It's not true. He didn't let that be the focus of the stories. But those agendas were still there. You know, the, the story still involved these these kinds of issues and women's rights and chauvinism. That was definitely a thing that was talked about in the comic books all the time. So, you know, here's this. And, and what better way to do that than to take this ancient Greek carouser who's been with many women and is just like, hey, what's up? How you doing? And it's like, whoa, 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 whoa. A slip of a woman trying to tell me the mighty Hercules, a demigod? what to do <laughs> i respect captain america heck i even kind of respect tony stark but i don't respect you wasp you know and that's basically what's going down but you know a little bit more subtle right and every time that he throws a little insult her way a little jab to remind her you're just a woman she she's probably not going to forget anytime soon <laughs> you know what i'm saying uh and she'll throw a little something back at him not necessarily to be feisty but sometimes yes uh, but for the most part, just trying to let him know, hey, stop. He doesn't like that. And each time it grates on him just a little bit more. Now, this does come into effect. It's very important to the story. It actually costs somebody their life. Just saying. It costs somebody their life. So Moonstone, uh, this is the Carla Sofen um, character. Moonstone shows up in her original, you know, all gold, yellowish, whatever costume with that goofy helmet looks like a hive member from over in DC Comics. And she's, um, but she, in this case, she's dressed up as a widow. She's actually dressed up as a widow. And she shows up and she's stoking the fires a little bit more saying, when Namor attacked, my husband was a longshoreman and he was, you know, out there and he was the captain of a ship and Namor, you know, people came in and attacked and my husband was killed in this. And Namor has to suffer. He has to pay. And, of course, you got the bleeding hearts who are just, you know, of course, going to believe. And they don't realize that it's Moonstone. Now, um, the, the what is it, the FBI? Whatever, some kind of a secret service agency. I think it's the FBI is is circling over. They're looking for Moonstone. Uh, and, you know, for, for various reasons that happened in earlier issues of the comics. And um, they're looking for her, and the CIA actually, or FBI actually notices her. It's like, whoa, that's her. No, I can see through the, the, the thing. Holy crap, that's actually her. We got to go after her. So they go and they put out an alert and whatnot, and then inside the Avengers notice this, and they're just like, whoa, not cool, man. So she tries to book. Now, um, a whole bunch of things happen in this, but she's trying to make as much of a scene as possible. Uh, she's trying to get out of it. She already you know, said what she has to say. The Avengers show up, Captain Marvel first, and Moonstone is petrified of Captain Marvel. This is the Monica Rambeau version of Captain Marvel. Admittedly, my favorite version, and I think that she should keep the name. Granted, Spectrum is kind of a cool name, too, so can't argue with that. Anyway, so, um, and it's Al Ewing who actually gave her that name. Uh, but anyway, because um, she was, what, Photon before that? I like Spectrum better. So... She um she shows up and a couple others start to try and show up also and you know hey let's have a conversation but Captain Marvel's the fastest she moves quite literally at the speed of light so uh, Carla's like I gotta get out of here Moonstone she she's like, I gotta get out of here and she just you know books um but she gets so petrified like she could have just gotten away and nobody would have seen her or anything but um she's just like oh look back oh. Uh, it's kind of calmed down a little bit. I gotta, I gotta do something to really freak out the crowd. So she uses her solid photonic energy and she boom blasts the um, this nearby fire hydrant. It goes up and people start freaking out. Unfortunately, this just winds up drawing attention. Mind you, she's scared, so she's thinking things are happening that aren't necessarily happening. She, you know, she goes to try and get out of there. Captain Marvel shows up. It's like, what the heck is going on here? She uses her um, uh, her light energy to actually create heat. And boom, melt the um, uh, the fire hydrant. 
And then she starts looking around. Carla's like, okay, I'm freaking terrified right now. Oh, look, that helicopter. Boom! She blasts out the, the, the tail rotor. Namor at this point finally flies out. He was trying to keep, you know, in the background and whatnot, but he's the only character there who can fly and carry things, who's strong and, and can fly. So he flies out there and he captures the thing. He's like, I don't want to show my face, but these guys are going to die otherwise. So he captures the thing and brings it down. There's some people who are like, oh, no, this is bull. Like, it was all a publicity stunt and whatever to try and, you know, give him a good name. Why are the Avengers doing this? At the same time, it's also like, well, he really did say this stuff. And the people, you know, the people inside the helicopter, the FBI, they're like, people actually believe that that we would risk our lives just so somebody could potentially save us? <laughs> anyway, so somebody goes and mentions, but that one widow, hey, where'd she go? What widow? And they start going back and forth. And yeah, <laughs> so um, what have you? The um, uh, the the wasp and the black knight are eventually able to capture Moonstone. She escapes into the sewer, but that doesn't really work out so well for her. And you know, yeah, so um, she gets caught. Um, meanwhile, there's a it looks like a mafia meeting happening, and they're talking about trying to go after Namor. Well, it turns out it's not actually the mafia. These are actually insurers. And they're like, we're going to go after Namor. So they do. Like all the uh, property damage that he did. It's kind of like an O.J. Simpson's case, but long before the O.J. Simpson case, you know, happened. It's the idea that, hey, you know, he's got diplomatic immunity and whatnot. He's forgiven by the federal state. However, we are allowed to do a civil lawsuit where we can sue him for money. I'm actually going to try and sue him for $2 billion. I feel like I should put my pinky up here, like, you know, in Austin Powers. Anyway, um, Bira, that's uh, Mira, uh, Mira, Bira, which is Namor's cousin, he shows up and he warns Namor that, hey, the uh, warlord Atuma uh, actually has um, uh, Marina. Now, let me go into a little bit of the thing here. Atuma is is a warlord. Uh, he's actually one of the barbarian tribes. Atlantis is split for the most part into the actual city dwellers. And then the, the barbarians are considered the ones who don't want to live in the city. They're still Atlanteans, you know what I'm saying? But they don't, and they still live in Atlantis proper, the, 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 the nation of Atlantis. They're still considered Atlantean citizens, but they don't choose to live inside of the domed city of Atlantis. Um, Mind you, so so much like New York City. There's New York, New York. Uh, there's New York City inside of New York County, which is, yes, also inside of New York State. So New York, New York, New York. Anyway, New York, New York, Atlantis, Atlantis. Same thing uh, for the most part. <laughs> so anyway, um, yeah, and uh, Marina is, uh, there's actually a, a 10 things about Marina in the uh, in comic book university. I'll try and do that link so you can find her. Uh, but she's a member of Alpha Flight and whole big story there. She's technically an extraterrestrial. There's a big deal going on here. So anyway, uh, in the next issue, issue number 271 of the Avengers, the Wasp finds out um, what's going on. Um, uh, what do you call it? And she's like, you know, hey, what's what's going on here? You know, because because um, uh, uh, Hercules is talking to Namor. Usually they're at it with each other, but they actually respect each other at this point. Hercules is like, hey, listen, you got to go do your business. You go do your business. I mean, we'd all like to come with you, but you're saying that you want to do this alone. You go do your thing. It's cool, man. When Wasp learns that Namor left and Hercules didn't consult her, you know, as the chairperson, not cool. Dane was there and he's like, this is not a good idea, bro. It's just not. And I mean, like, if you're on Namor's side, then what am I going to do? You know? So Hercules did a dumb dumb and. Dane, it's not his place to call her him out, but it is Janet's place to call him out. So he does. She does. And he says, uh, I'm not sure I expected it. It's not something I'd expect a woman to understand in regards to honor and things like that. And the need to prove yourself as a man. Cool, man. So Wasp basically returns an insult. And it's not even that big of an insult. It's more of a, hey, shut up. And he gets pissed at her. Dane is even like, dude, you need to relax. And he's like, oh, you're turning against me too? And like, he's, it's funny. Hercules is purposely drawn so dumb. Like, you know, the, the headband thing that he wears, it's actually like turned sideways. It's, it's covering like, I think his right eye. It's a boy because he's just so upset and whatnot. Like he can't think straight. 
she decides to go out and, you know, do something stupid. Um, as Herc is going out, probably to a bar or something like that, he finds an overturned truck. Some Subaru wind up, you know, cutting off, according to the driver, cutting off the, uh, the truck and the, the back end flipped over, the trailer flipped over. Oops. Hercules just walks over and it's like, oh, here, let me, let me, Guy's like, dude, that cop was mad at me. He was going to tear me up. He was going to tear me a new one. And my boss was going to take all this out of my pay. So, yeah, I, I guess there's no Teamsters Union. <laughs> so, anyway, he's just like, dude, the least I could do is buy you a drink. Herc is like, now nah, you're talking. Because <laughs> everything he's going to say is like, don't worry about it. That's what I was going to do anyway. Anyway, so he goes out and he's, he's going to buy him a beer. Just one. <laughs> um, there's a call that um, somebody broke into the Wasp's apartment down in Jersey. So she flies all the way back there from Manhattan and she gets in there and it's um, uh, probably close to Cresco. I don't remember exactly where it is, but it's probably someplace close to Cresco, New Jersey, because that's where uh, her ex-husband, um, um, uh, Ant-Man, Giant-Man, uh, Hank Pym used to live or still technically lives. Anyway. Um, so it turns out it was Paladin who broke into the apartment. Paladin, the all purple guy, you know, the soldier of fortune. Yeah, that guy. Uh, basically, like, she gets a phone call while he's there. It's a big deal. They're going to go down and interrogate together. They're going to interrogate Yellow Jacket. That's the Rita Damara version. Um, and all of a sudden, Grey Gargoyle and Scream Mimi show up to break them out. Um, Wasp hits the help beacon. Uh, Dane Whitman, uh, sends Monica. Dane Whitman is there hanging out at, um, Avengers Mansion. He's actually trying to work with Monica. He actually sent her into the sun because, you know, Dane Whitman, the Black Knight, he's actually a scientist. He's big on genetics. He's also big on physics. And he's pretty darn good in all the other sciences, too. He's no Tony Stark, but he's close enough. He's more than close enough. Um, what do you call it? So he's, he's talking to Monica and he's like, listen, um, you know what I think would be interesting is if you had the ability to actually phase through things instead of just being light, what if you can't get through something that otherwise, you know, light can't get through? He says, what about if you became neutrinos? She's like, what are those? And he's like, oh, well, check this out. And they're a real thing. <laughs> you know, saying they bombard us all the time. But the source of neutrinos, you know, essentially is the sun. So he sends her to the sun. That's eight light minutes away to go and do his, uh, you know, her thing. And she's trying to figure out how to do that. This actually does come in very importantly. This, this comes in, this becomes very important later anyway. Um, otherwise I wouldn't be telling you. <laughs> so, um, and he decides to go and try and help out black, um, black Knight decides to help out himself or to go and help out the wasp and all that, uh, himself. Herc meanwhile is drinking. <laughs> what else is new? Uh, cap is a few hours away on his motorcycle, but he's coming. Uh, so anyways, Dane shows up and, you know, everything turns out to be safe. And then Namor uh, calls up from a uh, like a safe house underwater and says, hey, I need help. It's like, oh, sure. No problem. We'll come and help. Issue number 272 of the Avengers now. Uh, the whole thing is basically the Avengers and Alpha Flight versus uh, Atlantis to try and save Marina. There's a big deal there. Feel free to go and read that issue. But the end of this issue is basically the idea that while Namor did join the Avengers not too long ago, he now has to take a uh, an indefinite leave of um, being on the active roster. So it's a temporary leave, but he doesn't know exactly how long that leave is going to be. He's got to try and find uh, Marina because her genetics were completely messed up, and it's a really messed up thing. That actually becomes a really huge story later on. And you can also cross over into the Alpha Flight. I think it's Alpha Flight issue number 16. You can go and check that out really quick to see what all happened there. But um, uh, Namor showed up a lot during that time in Alpha Flight for good reasons. Uh, mind you, uh, excuse me, when you might be asking, when did um, um, Namor actually show up? It's in uh, the, uh, the the Namor Limited series. So there's like, a, I forget how long it was. I didn't actually go back and read these. But he's had a whole bunch of limited series. And this particular one, I think this was the first limited series that Namor was in that, you know, titled Namor. That um, actually showed the March, you know, Atlantis attacks. It's always Atlantis attacks. It's all it ever is. So, um, in issue number 273, this is the um, 25th anniversary cover also. All of these things happened. So, in November of 1986, 
that's when um, all of the uh, 25th anniversary covers showed up. So this particular one, I'm sure I'm showing it on the screen. It's some um, probably over here. Um, we actually see uh, Dane Whitman, the Black Knight, and you got the 25th anniversary. Logo. These are my favorite covers. I'm trying to collect all of them. I've got a lot of them. Might even have most of them. I'm not sure. I have a lot of them. <laughs> and they're freaking amazing covers. I absolutely love these covers. They recently tried to redo these covers with the 80th anniversary of Marvel. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Wasn't nearly as cool. But I appreciate the effort. So all of November, all of these comic books have this. We're going to get to the Thor one pretty soon. Um, yeah, but yeah. So anyway, um, issue number 273. The Wrecker is disguised uh, as some bar patron who's, you know, messing with, with Hercules. Hercules is getting drunk again. And he's just basically getting, he's gleaning some info off of Hercules uh, about, you know, the Avengers roster, what's going on, who he's mad at, everything, you know. Um, so then all of a sudden, uh, Baron Zemo comes walking. This is Helmet Zemo, the son of the original Baron Zemo. Uh, that's Baron Zemo. The, the, the original Baron Zemo is the one who, um, uh, he's the one who laid the trap for Captain America right at the end of World War II that wound up ending in the death, we thought, not until Brubaker comes along later, the, the death of Bucky. So, yeah, so this is a really big deal. And then, of course, he wound up dying. And then um, th this is his son who showed up for a short time during, uh, during a whole bunch of things. But he also showed up specifically during the, uh, the death of the Red Skull issues, which was Captain America issue number 300. So right around that time. And I think it was an issue number 301 where he died mysteriously you know enough he comes back they actually explain in the comic book in a couple of issues you'll see that whatever it's actually it's it's a, it's a decent enough you know return to life so to speak I, i'm like okay i'm 100 behind this i wish there were more deaths like this instead of no i died and i got better good job x-men so um what happened the uh uh zemo basically reforms the masters of evil at this point the Masters of Evil um, essentially consist of the Absorbing Man and Titania, can't separate those two, the entirety of the Wrecking Crew, Mr. Hyde, Yellow Jacket, uh, Blackout, yes, Blackout, more on him in a bit, Moonstone, and the Fixer. Also, Tiger Shark and, here's the big heavy header, Goliath. Big, by no means an undersimplification of the word. So, um, this is the new Masters of Evil. And um, uh, what do you call it? They show up at the Avengers mansion in this issue and they break through the Omnium steel gates and they find Jarvis alone. Uh, yeah, they beat the crap out of Jarvis. Uh, Mr. Hyde, almost like Mr. Hyde is actually the enforcer. He's the one who's actually in charge of beating up the, the bad guy, you know, the, 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 the enemies, I should say, the good guys and uh, capturing them. And he slams Jarvis around a little bit and brings him into the um, the room, you know, ties him up and whatnot. But he was alone. It was actually supposed to be Hercules who was in charge tonight. But he wound up leaving because he had a date with some hot chick, you know. So uh, Jarvis said, oh, don't worry, sir. I'm happy to take over. And he was just going to use the the general um, um, uh, defenses of uh, – at um, Avengers, Avengers Mansion in order to keep everybody safe, right? And it didn't quite work out for him. Anyway, excuse me. So um, at this point, uh, what have you now? Oh, oh, really quick, Omnium. You might be wondering about Omnium. Okay, in the Marvel Universe, it's essentially the second strongest independent steel. So you've got Adamantium, then Omnium, and then Titanium. After that would be osmium, which is what Colossus is made out of. And then I think Wakandan, uh, Wakandan vibranium would be the next one and whatnot. But that has its own property, so whatever. And, of course, I'm, I'm saying adamantium, like main true adamantium and secondary adamantium. Yeah, 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 yeah. Anyway, omnium steel. That's what the gate is made out of. That's what the, uh, the uh, wall all around is made out of, too. They decide not to hop the fence or do whatever. They decide to break down the fence. I don't know, man, whatever, whatever. I guess they didn't have any flyers, you know, or enough flyers, you know, whatever. So they decided to break down the fence. I'm not questioning it. Uh, maybe there were worse defenses if they hopped over the uh, 
the, the walls. So anyway, the Masters of Evil are now in control of Avengers Mansion, and the uh, Black Knight is at a gala with Wasp, and um, he's Black Knight basically has never been lucky in love. All right, he's never been lucky in love. Just no, <laughs> and he's trying to hook up with Janet. Janet really just doesn't see him that way. So it is what it is, brah. Deal with it. Deals. And um, Paladin shows up, and she's actually more interested in Paladin, even though they're really technically just friends. They're, you know, sometimes they can be more than friends. She's a, she's a grown woman. She can do what she wants, all right? So Dane is a little bit jealous, a lot jealous of Paladin, and he kind of leaves, and he comes home on his own. Uh, he comes back to Avengers Mansion alone with the Masters of Evil inside, not realizing what's up. You might say, oh, what happened? He doesn't notice the gate. No, he didn't, because they actually had another gate to replace it that looked like theirs. But anyway, <laughs> I figured it would be easier to just jump over the damn thing. But he decides to just go, go through the gate, just open whatever, and just goes in. Uh, while he's walking around, he's like, uh, oh, man, I'm so mad, blah, 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 blah. He, gets all, he doesn't notice a lot of what's going on you know, around, but he gets but so far in. He's like, hey, wait a second. The light in that foyer is never off. And he right away starts to draw a sword. Lucky him. Because all of a sudden here comes a blast out of nowhere. It's Rita, the yellow jacket. And he's just like, bing, and deflects. He's like, what the frick did you get in here? He gets ready to start going after her, starts chasing her down. Right through the wall, a big fist with a green sleeve. Mr. Hyde. Told you, he's the enforcer in this. All right, pay attention. He just straight up, boom, clocks him on the side of the head. Comes over to, he's, and Black Knight's like, he's sprawled out he didn't have to be hit anymore that's real talk and he's just lying he's like i'm uh, what the uh, it happened and he's like ah, i'm mr hyde and you're stupid and he just bow 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 it's oh it's a terrifying scene bro he beats the holy hell out of freaking um black knight dane whitman whitman's going to be unconscious for a couple of issues here all right he got the snot beat out of him, and then some. So, yeah. Um, so, at this point, Captain uh, Marvel gets a, a phone call. She's been, you know, she's back from the sun and all that good stuff, and she shows up back at um, on Earth, but she decides to go to France. She starts taking advantage of the idea that, hey, man, you know what I'm saying? Like, I can move as fast as the speed of light, so I'm going to fly over. I'm going to hang out in France. I'm going to have some crepes, and I'm going to fly over here. I'm going to do this. I'm going to fly over there and do that. She gets a call from the Wasp. Hey, I need you to come into the uh, meeting room or whatever of the uh, the Avengers Mansion. You know, it's an emergency. Quick. And she's like, oh, shoot. So she just all the way around the other side of the earth, right in there. It's like, um, Jarvis, why are you jacked up? Um, Dane, why are you jacked up? Why are you both tied up? That's when all of a sudden um, Blackout shows up. Now, Blackout. Blackout is a guy, if you remember the uh, siege on New York. Yeah. Spencer had Nick Spencer. He had um, Blackout as one of the main guys there. He's, you know, he's a little loco. He's got a couple of uh, screws loose. He's a, he's a couple ants short of a picnic. And, uh, you know, at, during Siege, he puts a, a Dark Force thing all over all of New York City. Uh, well, most of New York City. In this particular case, he's not that powerful yet. But he is more powerful than he was recently. Instead of just forming Dark Force, he now has the ability to uh, put a Dark Force shell all around, like a big cube around Avengers Mansion. There's like a three-story mansion. I don't know if there's an attic. I think there is an attic, so there's that. Anyway, uh, yeah, there of course there is because it's freaking Quinjet in there also. Reinforced. Hey. So um, big old freaking you know, thing around the mansion. Anyway. Um, but he's still a little... And Moonstone was supposed to be in charge of taking care of him. She made a machine that's supposed to make it so that she's able to control him. But Baron Zemo is like, I don't trust Moonstone. And for good reason. And he says, hey, you know, fix her. Why don't you copy that machine, make it into a little headband. We can put it under my thing. And then, you know, I can uh, control Knucklehead uh, Blackout. Because he is super ridiculously freaking powerful. So when... Uh, she shows up, when Captain Marvel shows up, this is like the big heavy hitter. I know everybody's like, you know, oh, there's Hercules and there was Namor and stuff like that. Yeah, that's cute. 
No, Captain Marvel is the most powerful Avenger. She's one of the most powerful beings in the Marvel Universe. Just facts, all right? Um, what do you call it? She shows up, and she doesn't have hardly any time to think about it. Blackout shows up. She's like, ah, I've taken Blackout out before. I got this. And she goes to, you know, bless, like, uh, how come nothing's working? Oh, crap, he's starting to cover me up. No problem. I'll turn into neutrinos. In this particular case, it doesn't work. It's worked before. It's not working now. It's like, what's going on? And she gets absorbed and sent into the Dark Force realm. We find that out later. She's in the Dark Force dimension. This is different from the Dark Dimension, mind you. There's the Dark Dimension where Clea and the uh, Mindless Ones are, Dormammu and all that. And then there's the Dark Force dimension, which at the time, there was nothing there. It was just Dark Force. And uh, a couple of characters in the Marvel Universe, including um, Cloak, like Cloak and Dagger, they actually are able to tap into the uh, Dark Force dimension. Um, what do you call it? So yeah, they're in there. And Nick Spencer later on, brilliantly, made, uh, made it so there's actually a planet with beasties there. For the most part, it's just darkness. But yes, there is actually life, um, some life at the very least, in the Dark Force dimension. Okay. So Captain Marvel vs. Blackout, one for Blackout. Captain Marvel, Monica Rambeau, is now off the frigging table. That's a big, big deal. So at this point, they all start talking to each other. Um, well, what's left for the most part is talking to each other. Captain America shows up and has a conversation with Wasp at her place. Um, he actually flies in to, you know, on a helicopter. Somebody gives him a ride. And he jumps off and does this, you know, show off thing. Has a conversation with Wasp. You know, hey, what's going on? Uh, uh, what do you call it? You know, I was just, um, and, and this is in his comic book. Uh, he's, he's doing his thing and, and, you know, that's issue number, um, 324 of Captain America. He's out there and he's, um, and, uh, what do you call it? He's doing his thing where he's like, Hey, listen, so I got into a fight with, um, uh, Dave Cannon, that's whirlwind and the trapster and, you know, had to beat them up and whatnot. And I just figured I'd let you know. She's like, Oh, yeah, that does concern me. Like, Canon has had it, had it out for me for a long time. Uh, Whirlwind is actually a character who used to be called the Human Top, and he was a major enemy of Giant Man uh, and Giant Man and the Wasp. And uh, he wound up later on developing a serious infatuation with the Wasp. Uh, for a while, he was actually disguising himself as the Avengers' chauffeur just so that he can get close to her. Like, this is some really freaky weird stuff, man. Like, wow. Like he was stalker supreme, so of course she's curious. Like, oh wow, the whirlwind. Yeah, that's dangerous. Also, that issue of the the comic book is where he actually got an upgrade. He went to the Tinkerer. Tinkerer is in that book also, and that's when he wasn't just you know he was still always whirlwind, but he actually upgraded his suit. Got his suit upgraded. Got the chainmail on there instead of the the naked skin, you know, under the green armor. Also got the the whirl uh, the buzzsaw blades on his arms and the little. Buzzsaw blades to release from his belt when he spins around super fast to jack fools up. Anyhow, um, yeah, cool stuff happened. <laughs> so uh, she's like, yeah, that's a really big deal. But I am wondering, though, why did you feel a need to come all the way down here to tell me instead of just call me? You could have just called me and, and told me this, you know, because I do want to know, you know, because it's, it's him, the psychopath. But hey, why did you come all the way down here? So it's because I actually did call you at Avengers Mansion. And you didn't seem very interested. She's like, what? But I wasn't there. He's like, I know. That's why I knew it wasn't you. So something's going on in Avengers Mansion. And we need to find out what's going on. So interesting. Zemo pulled this plan almost to perfection. That was, of all the things, that was his number one, number one biggest dumb dumb move. That he wound up messing up on. No plan is perfect. You know what I'm saying? So... Yeah, it was a great plan, except he decided to use Whirlwind in this particular case, as opposed to somebody else, to try and keep Captain America busy. Darn it. Anyway, so um, um, blah, 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 the, um, uh, what do you call it? They decided, you know, let's let's team up and let's go and try and, you know, figure out what's going on. So anyway, the... Um, the Wrecking Crew and everybody else is inside Avengers Mansion. They're trash in the place. Like, listen, find what you can find that's cool and steal it, loot the place, destroy everything else. It's like, all right, no problem. 
uh, Wrecking Crew come across uh, the Porcupine's armor. Um, the porcu This was in a Captain America book that happened where the Porcupine, the, the main character of the Porcupine, was um, he wound up dying through his own uh, mistakes. Uh, anyway, he wound up accidentally getting himself killed. He's trying to sell his armor to the Avengers, and Captain America's like, if you can help me find the Serpent Society, hey, this would be a good thing. So, yeah. Um, yeah, this happens. So, <laughs> he's like, uh, anyway, he winds up dying in that issue, and uh, uh, Captain America actually says some cool things to him. He's like, listen, you you helped me go against these guys. And it's like, oh, don't don't try and build me up. I know I was a bad guy. He's like, no, you you did a good thing. You you know, if you are going to die, you died a, a hero. So like, don't build me up like that, man. I was just a stupid criminal. Like everybody made fun of me. He's like, no, you're a very honorable foe. You're a very tough foe. And, you know, I was, you know, I was always worried going against you, basically. And he winds up dying. But at least he died with some dignity, you know. And Captain America took his armor and put it up on display in Avengers Mansion uh, not to, you know, be like, ah, look at this, you know, trophy that we have. No, rather, you know, as this was an honorable foe of the Avengers because he tried to turn kind of good-ish. So um, what happens now? He, um, the, 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 the Wrecking Crew see this armor and they're like, look at what they did to Porcupine's armor. This is just an outrager. And they just wind up getting themselves madder and madder and they wreck it. Man, that's really, these guys are fuss. I'm just saying. So um, uh, the wasp sneaks in and she starts looking around and she sees what's going on. And it's like, you know, holy crap. Uh, and it's like, you know, Jarvis, I'm going to get you out of here. Dane's unconscious. Still, I'm going to get you out of here. She's like, he's like, no, Master Hercules should be coming home right now. You have to go in and make sure that he doesn't walk into this trap. She's like, oh, crap. So she books. She goes outside. She's like, you know, and, and. Hercules gets out of the, the, the car. He is drunk off his freaking rocker. Turns out he was also drugged. Um, what you call it? Yeah, he gets out and uh, Tanya Seeley is in the car with him. She's the girl that he was hanging out with. You might recognize his name as the Black Mamba. She was one of the original Serpent Squad. And um, uh, I think it was issue number 64 of the Marvel 2 and one She's just like, you know, hey, so, uh, hey, Zemo, I just brought him out. He's out front right now. I just left him, you know, in the cab. Uh, you're going to wire that money to my Swiss account? All right. Oh, he's super drunk, and I helped to drug him also. So he's out of it. And he really was out of it. The wasp shows up. Hey, you have to stop. And Captain America shows up also. You know, he's disguised like, hey, it's your old buddy Stevie. Come on, let me show you my new van. <laughs> there's some candy in my van <laughs> anyway so they decided to go into the van really quick and it's like you know they're giving uh herc an update cap is trying to do his thing trying to look up some stuff and whatnot in his souped up van and and hercules is like well we got to go and we got to save some people and it's like you know dude you're drunk but you know listen we got to formulate a plan we can't just go balls to the wall and run in there and she's he's like i'm sick and tired of you doing this and i'm gonna vote you out as soon as we're done with this. And he kicks right through the uh, freaking door. He jacks up Cap's van. I'm saying he deserves what's about to happen to him in spades. So he goes out. He's like, I'm sick of her. and I'm going to put in a vote to have her removed from chairwoman early. Her tenure thing, whatever, was actually coming to an end anyway, you know, pretty soon. But yeah, he, Herc is just whatever. <laughs> so... Uh, he leaves and he starts walking and he busts right through a freaking wall and uh, Wasp and Cap, not very ready, but they have to go in and try and give him back up. But he was way too fast and they're just like, crap, we can't get there in time. So they go running up. Um, they want to get caught by the um, uh, the security systems, the new security systems that the Fixer wound up setting up. These clamps come out, you know, and they capture them both. Wasp was able to blast hers. Cap wasn't able to get rid of his on time. And all of a sudden, this um, speaker comes up and lets out this high-pitched screeching noise. It, it stuns them. She gets hurt, but he, she's able to get away. And she, Cap is yelling, get out of here. Ah, the Sonics. And he winds up being knocked unconscious from it. She's pretty much knocked. Yeah, she's knocked unconscious, too. But she's actually able to get off of the property. 
And when the dark force dome goes up at this point, this is when the dark force dome, not a dome, but, you know, the cube goes up. Um, she's on the outside of it. Cap is on the inside. He gets pulled in. His unconscious body gets pulled in. Freaking Herc. Meanwhile, what happens to Herc? Well, let's get into all that. Got to turn the page of my notes. Uh, issue number 274. Uh, this is basically where Herc gets beaten to death. Yeah. Yeah, that happens. So this issue is called Even a God Can Die. And he gets quite literally beaten to death in this. Everybody shows up and they start pounding on him. And he's doing a good job against them, but he's also drunk and drugged. And he's simply not ready for this. And eventually he is just, even a God can die, man. So yeah. Um, what do you call it? When Wasp finally comes to, she's like, what the frick is going on? And they just like eject his body from the, the inky blackness of that, you know, dark force goo. It's like, holy crap! They bring him to the hospital where he's pronounced dead on arrival. More on that in a bit. Um, what do you call it? Cap for his his point. Oh, um, also, uh, t ten blocks. This is the next issue now. Two, issue number two hundred seventy five. Uh, there's a ten block area of New York City under martial law at this point, uh, because you know all around Avengers Mansion, Tiger Shark winds up by uh, getting out. He was he he was the first person to go at it with um, Herc, but Herc, yeah, he didn't necessarily make a, a you know a, a jabroni out of him, but yeah, he took him out. As far as um, uh, Tiger Shark though, he was really only in it for the sake of going after Namor, and since Namor wasn't actually in the team anymore, you know the Avengers like oh oh well, so uh, they were like yeah you can leave, <laughs> don't move if you ask me, but whatever, like you can leave now, bye. So he left. He wound up, you know, having to escape. He stole a taxi, all that stuff, and he got out of there. He just wound up causing more of a distraction, so you know, for for the police and whatnot. So they actually wound up helping Zemo and his team anyway. Um, Wasp is at the hospital with Herc at this point, and Ant Man shows up. This is actually Scott Lang as Ant Man showing up. It was like, you know, hey, I'm here to help. Well, that's a good thing because Titania and Absorbing Man go to the hospital because they're going to try and make sure that they get finished with uh what's his name um hercules because they're not they didn't know that he was pronounced dead they were there to finish the job just in case um so titania and absorbing man they're tough as nails well they were actually originally on another case so originally this was um in um the amazing spider-man issue that i was talking about off oh, of crying out loud what was that amazing spider-man issue issue number 283 uh, they showed up there and they were supposed to be disguised, but Titania goes out and she decides to, you know, do a quick diamond heist, you know, by herself. She's like, I'm going to take a walk and she steals some diamonds. Spider-Man wound up finding out about it and follows her back in season and Crusher Creel, Zorn Man, is like, hon, you can't be doing this, man. We're here on a mission for the Masters of Evil. You you can't, you know, risk us trouble. Holy crap, is that Spider-Man out the window? It's like, we got a book. We got a book. So they get, you know, she he, he tells Janet Van Dyne, she's like, oh, hey, we're going to, you know, send some people out to try and deal with things. But unfortunately, that doesn't wind up happening because of the under siege thing. So Spider-Man have to go after themselves, uh, after him, after them himself. Titania is actually terrified of Spider-Man because, hey, you know, he, uh, he helped to beat the crap out of her when she was still just Skeeter on the, um, um, there was issue number three of Secret Wars, the original Secret Wars. So... Yeah, really bummed bad for her. Uh, she freaks out. It's like, he's going to kill me. And Crusher's like, ah, what are you doing? What are you doing? Because they were supposed to pick up a heavy hitter for uh, addition to the team for the Masters of Evil. Uh, later on, you'll come to find out that this was actually Mongoose. Now, Mongoose, this is, a lot of people consider this his first appearance. All you see is his shadow inside of a, uh, it looks like Donatello. You know, when he's in his disguise or the thing when he's in his disguise with the trench coat and the hat. But that's all you see is just his silhouette, his shadow, and you see his teeth also. You have no idea who this is. Um, like it could have been Sabretooth. You know what I'm saying? At first, I remember that's, that's what I thought it was. And then later on, because I'm also reading Thor, um, in issue number 391 of Thor, much later, this is Mongoose's first full appearance, first true appearance, not his appearance in the shadows. That nonsense. Anyway, might still be worth something, but 
issue 391 of Thor is actually the big deal. Hey, it also happens to be the first appearance of Eric Masterson, who is Thunderstrike. Just saying, putting that out there. Um, I got that issue too. So um, what happens now? Uh, they were there to pick him up. <coughs> Once he actually got himself into America, he didn't need uh, them anymore. So he was just doing this as a means to actually get into America. Now that he's in there, it's like, oh, they didn't pick me up. Oh, well, I'm out. So he leaves. That simple. That freaking simple. Yeah, he bounces. And um, we go back to the Avengers Mansion. Yeah. Um, uh, Zemo is trying really hard to break Cap. Now, mind you, Dean is still unconscious. <laughs> like, he's in a coma, practically. Um, Zemo's trying to break Cap. And he's just like, hey, what's up? Hey, here's a picture of you and Bucky. Wasn't this the last picture that you two took together? Rip. You know? Uh, hey, uh, Hyde, Mr. Hyde, why don't you go and grab that um, that heater shield in there? And that's Captain America's original shield. You know what I'm saying? And it's like, hey, why don't you uh, see if that thing's as tough as Cap's, you know, new shield, you know, his, his round shield, the vibranium shield. It's like, oh, yeah, sure. <laughs> and it's like, oh! You know what I'm saying? He crushes his shield. But Cap doesn't even flinch. Later on, much later on, it would be retconned that that was actually just a replica of that original shield. Uh, he gave the original shield to Chichaka, that's um, uh, Black Panther's father. So there's that. Um, anyway, yeah, so but a bang. Uh, on, to, on to here. Um, Cap is pretty much unfazed. He's like, whatever, man, that's not the mission. My mission is kick your butt. You keep on thinking you're going to just take out Wasp. It's not going to happen, bro. You know what I'm saying? I trust her implicitly to kick your butt. So Zemo's upset that he can't break Cap. So he decides, if I can't hurt you directly, I'm going to kill you eventually. For now, I'm going to have Hyde beat up uh, uh, Jarvis. And he does. Guys, this is literally like, you remember when Joker beat up on uh, Tim Drake? Yeah. It's like that. You might as well have a crowbar in his hand. Except Hyde is a lot more dangerous. He's a lot stronger. He hits a lot harder, I should say. And he beats the holy hell out of Jarvis. Like, he is a reborn in Christ, sinless mother fathead, straight out the freaking uh, River Jordan after baptism. You know what I'm saying? By John the Baptist. This dude, straight up, he is sin-free after this beating that he took. Like, mea culpa, mea maxima culpa. You can't ask for, for for forgiveness, the way that this dude is now sin-free from the beating he takes. Like, he's held up, and you're thinking to yourself, he's dead. There's no way Jarvis survived this. Wow. Um, so he's just jacked, and you see the look on Captain America's face, and actually the screams that Jarvis does while he's being beaten, like, just to give you, you know, for example, actually wakes Dean up finally. It was a little nappy-nap slumber time. Dude, Jarvis got whooped. So, through all of this, um, uh, what do you call it? Titania and Ozora Mina were actually beat because they, uh, in the Spider-Man comic book, because they were, uh, uh, Titania got shrank and they just overwhelmed um, uh, Absorbing Man. Excuse me, that wasn't in the Spider-Man comic book. That was actually, uh, oh, for crying out loud, I just screwed that whole thing up. Sorry. They, uh, these two showed up, Titania and um, Absorbing Man, showed up at the hospital to finish the job on Herc, like I was saying, and only Ant-Man and the Wasp were there, so they had to take him down. Now, something interesting happened, something that I don't remember ever seeing before. Uh, his Ant-Man's helmet, Scott Lang's helmet, that he can, you know, talk to ants, uh, he was able to use it to form some kind of a disruptor that kind of went and blasted, what's his name? wasn't as powerful as Wasp Sting. She got a powerful as hell Sting. But that being said, yeah, big deal there. Like, wow, what did you, how did he do that? I don't think, I don't know, I don't know if they ever did that again in the comic books. I think this might be the only time that they actually did that. That being said, uh, we're going to move on to issue number 276 at this point. The Masters of Evil, um, uh, beware, why did I write beware? Uh, they're not called the Avengers for nothing. Oh, yeah, that's right. Um, on the front cover, it actually says, Masters of Evil, beware. They're not called the Avengers for nothing. This issue is actually called Revenge. So the Avengers are actually looking for revenge at this point. 
Uh, Captain Marvel escapes from the Dark Force dimension through Shroud. It's actually really cool because she every so often she would see this little light and she would fly to it, but she wasn't quite quick enough. I know. Her, really? Because the Shroud would actually only form this for a little bit. It's not just um, uh, Cloak, Tyrone Johnston, who does this. No, it's actually also um, Shroud who taps in the Dark Force dimension. He just can't do nearly as much as Cloak can. That's fine. He's cool enough as it is, dude. So he, every so often he's summoning the, the Dark Force, and that's the little bit of a light that she sees. And she was able to escape through it this time. And she's like, oh, my God, where are we? San Francisco, what are you doing inside of my cloak? You know, what are you doing inside of my darkness? It's like, oh, hey, help. So she beats up on this mugger guy, whatever, who's about to shoot him. And then, yeah, she winds up uh, leaving. She goes back to hang out with um, uh, the Wasp, uh, the Wasp and Ant-Man. So, yay, Captain Marvel's back. They're, you know, superpowered dude. Um, this entire time, Dane Whitman has been trying to summon his sword. But the, but the Ebony Blade and um, Cap Shield are being investigated by the Fixer. Got him inside of like the stasis field where he can actually do some, some work on it. There's like a shielding over it, and he's trying to, you know decipher what's going on you know how can i recreate these or something like that how can i really figure out what these things are uh he's doing a whole bunch of things so he wants to be distracted you know or so often but for the most part this dude uh dane whitman is trying so hard to summon his sword that at one point um it's like a half an hour of him doing this that dr uh druid actually realizes you know i was like whoa i'm feeling a super powered you know force out there dr druid is special because he does do magic in a way, druidic magic. He's not particularly powerful, but he's one of the few non-mutants who has the ability of telepathy. So he feels the psychic pull that uh, Dane Whitman, is, the psychic energies that Dane Whitman is trying to summon, uh, you know, call force in, in order to, to bring a sword to him. Uh, not something that Dane usually does, mind you, but yeah, a lot of psychic force. Um so Dr. Druid shows up. Thor shows up also. Now, uh, this all happens between pages five and seven of Thor issue number 373. This is also that um, 25th anniversary cover. And it's Thor with his armor and the beard and all this stuff. Um, now, Thor is not, well, you know what? I'll get into that in a hot minute. So the lights go out in the museum, like uh, in the mansion, like uh, what the frick is happening? When that happens, uh, Dane suddenly has his sword again. Jarvis is still jacked up, but Dane suddenly has his sword again. It's like, oh, I suddenly feel my sword. You know what I'm saying? Like, the, you know, with the lights being out, suddenly I'm able to summon it. So he, boop, gets his sword. Now you see, he's able to cut himself free, and he's able to cut Captain America free. And this is great because Mr. Hyde is the only one in the room with them, and you just see punches coming out of nowhere. Dane goes and trips uh, Mr. Hyde. Uh, Dane's got a lot of... Um, a lot of self-control, because I had to cut hide in two, man. Maybe in three, just for the sake of conversation, you know? Anyway, so, um, excuse me. Um, uh, yeah, Jarvis is completely jacked up. And um, Black Knight with his sword, you know, Cap's free and all this stuff. There's a big fight. Uh, Captain Marvel actually burnt a hole in the, through the ground all the way around to get up there. And all the other Avengers that, you know, I mentioned had showed up. Hyde's last moment because he gets jacked up by Black Knight and Captain America and he's stumbling and he just boom smacks into Thor and just falls over now Thor winds up flinching when he gets hit I know right uh, he's wearing the armor and all this stuff and he winds up flinching and uh Janet's like hey Thor did you just flinch are you okay and he's like I am okay but he's literally talking through gritted teeth. And she's like, you know, in herself, doesn't sound like you're okay, but I'm going to let it go. You know, she decides to just keep it to herself. Now, Thor is super weak because this is actually Thor in his helicursed form. So much earlier in the comic books, this is the, the um, Walter Simonson run, which arguably, and that's mostly me arguing, don't, don't contradict me, um, this is the greatest run on Thor. In fact, this is the greatest run on comic books ever in the history of forever. Nobody has ever matched the Walter Simonson run on Thor 
in comics anywhere. It's never happened. This is the greatest run in comic books. Um, and in this particular moment, um, Thor had invaded, um, what do you call it, uh, uh, hell, and wound up removing a bunch of, you know, beings from her, you know, the dead and whatnot, and took some stuff from her, and she wasn't happy about it, so she decided to get revenge, and she hit him with a, uh, a beam that cursed him. So he can never die right now. His soul is not allowed to leave his body, but at the same time, he's also super weakened. One of the parts of that uh, weakness was actually when she got into a fist fight with him, and he tried to cover up with her. She, she and he got into a fight with each other, like a wrestling match, and he wound up winning. But you know, he the, the touch of Hela is is deathly. She can actually kill uh, most people with just a touch. Thor, not quite so bad, but she winds up, you know, it's called the hand of glory. She winds up hitting him, you know, uh, with with his hand, with her hand, even though he had a, a bandana over his face, and it winds up scratching him up, and it's a permanent mark that, like, permanently and forever scars his face. It's a horrible scar. Um, he covers, you know, his face and whatnot, so so he doesn't have to, you know, be seen. But later on, he just winds up growing a beard to hide that terrible scar. So that's why he had the beard. Uh, he's also got the armor because his bones are actually brittle at this point. Very soon in the Thor comic books, in fact, when he actually, like, I think it's the next issue, he goes into the Morlock tunnels to try and um, uh, uh, save the Morlocks. He's like, what the heck is going on? And he actually winds up getting himself jacked up. He actually gets a bone broken, which is something that has never happened to Thor in his life. So this was, wow, that's why he's got the armor on, because he's very brittle. He's also got a bionic arm, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? There's a, they're all, well, there's an exoskeleton. Um, uh, Tony Stark actually made a, retrofitted a, um, a bionic for his arm so that he can still use it, even though it's broken. And by the way, he will never heal. This is a really big deal, and we'll go into all that stuff at some other point. Um, what do you call it? Um, La, 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 la. Uh, so what happens? The, okay, so Rita was watching all of this happening. Yellow Jacket. She was watching all this stuff happen, and she flies off to report to Zemo. Uh, Baron Zemo, for his point, is like, well, we need to get out of here. She's like, oh, well, the fixer just left. And he's like, yeah, don't worry about the fixer. Uh, he can take care of himself. And she's like, huh, well, I'm not too upset with that because he's been hitting on me, and he's super creepy. That being said, um, the fixer was very loyal to him. So I don't get it. Why is he leaving him? Huh. I guess that means that there is no loyalty coming from Zemo, which means that the second that we outweigh our usefulness or his usefulness for us, then we're fodder to him. So I got to make sure I'm not useless to him. Um, so he decides, you know, let's get out of here. And she, she's leaving with him. Um, Dr. Druid is able to go up on the roof and, well, actually, Dr. Druid walks up to the, um, the thing, because, like, these army guys, they've been shooting bazookas at this darn thing, and they're like, we might as well call an airstrike. I mean, how do you do that in freaking New York City? You know what I'm saying? We can't, but that's the only thing we, we think might be able to penetrate this darkness. Dr. Druid, however, walks up and he touches the darkness and he's using his psychic abilities, magical abilities, trying to, you know, seep through and like, what's going on? Oh, it's attached to this guy uh, called Blackout. Okay, let's have a conversation with him. Huh, his mind seems to be controlled. Let me free his mind. How about that? Um, she, he first starts by saying, hey, let me, you know, you got to drop this shield. And he does. So Druid is able to get inside. Um, goes up on the roof, you know, and, and Zemo is up there. Um, uh, trying to control uh, uh, Blackout because because Zemo or uh, because Druid freed Blackout's mind. Moonstone is actually up there also. It's like what the frig! And then Captain Marvel shows up. She's like ah, and she books. She winds up getting herself jacked up to the point where she actually breaks her neck by slamming into a mountain. Yes, this character who can phase slams into a mountain. Read the comic book. You'll understand exactly how this happened. Mind you, I am leaving more than enough available that you are. I hope you're at least definitely going to want to buy these comic books. 
you know, it, it is actually in trade paperback form. You can find it in trade paperback form. But anyway, uh, and I'll try and leave links below, <laughs> you know what I'm saying, for all that good stuff. Uh, but yes, um, there's there's this big deal. She actually breaks her neck. So Captain Marvel's out doing that. And uh, Zemo is on the roof with Truett. He uses a needle and it's like, and, and, you know, he goes, and gets hit with a needle that paralyzes his body. But his mind still works. So he's trying to make sure that um, uh, Blackout get, stays free. Zemo is trying to control him with that headband. It winds up rupturing an aneurysm inside of Blackout's brain and killing, uh, what's his face, uh, Black, uh, Blackout. So he's he actually dies. He expires. He's dead. You know what I'm saying? Um, uh, what do you call it? So uh, let's see. Okay, Cap and Thor have to fight against the Wrecking Crew. Thor is not having this, and he actually he's like, you know, you guys are are working with the power of the gods, and it's not rightfully so. They actually got their power from the Norn, uh, the, the, excuse me, the Norn Queen, not all the Norns, the Norn Queen, uh, Carnilla. And he, he has all of the power that they have put back into the talisman, which is actually the Wrecker's crowbar. And they all get knocked unconscious, them from losing all their powers and him from having too much power. He has four times the power he usually has because he was sharing that power. And Thor's like, now I'm going to actually take the power out of there and back into my hammer. I'm going to reabsorb that power into here. Uh, unfortunately, Goliath shows up. Goliath is literally the heaviest hitter in there. Goliath is the one who mostly beat up on Hercules. And Hercules was, you know, drunk, but he's still more powerful than Thor is now. Thor winds up getting um, into this fight with um, Goliath, but yeah, it's not easy. It's definitely not easy. Uh, but Thor at least isn't drunk. And he's got a heck of a, you know, a, a good, you know, power in his hammer, and he's just, yeah, he's able to handle his own against this guy. The Wrecker, ha however, winds up waking up during this point, and Captain America is going against him without his shield, and the Wrecker is now four times more powerful than he's ever, you know, than he usually is. So it's like when he first got the power before he gave it away, because he's four times more powerful. Anyway, they go out with each other. Now, mind you, with one quick little bit of help from uh, Wasp, which just caused a distraction, Cap was actually able to defeat the Wrecker. Why? Because he's Captain of freaking America. That's why. <laughs> and Thor eventually defeats um, Goliath also. Really cool battle. Um, Captain America after Mr. Zemo, after Drew, yep, all the good stuff. So now issue number 277, the final issue. This is basically the final fight. This is where everything winds up getting resolved, and Captain America goes one on one against Zemo. Zemo, who has Captain America's um, uh, shield, mind you. And they wind up going out with each other. Zemo is blaming him for the death of his father and all the tragedy, blah, blah, blah. This is something that, you know, he's been dealing with, you know, and, and he's been talking to Cap about a lot while he's trying to talk to him and get him to, you know, freak out. Cap, however, isn't buying it. He's finally like, you need to shut up, dude. Because you know what? Everybody's been through something. And your father did this to himself. I didn't make your, your father sympathize with Nazis. All right? And he's like, yeah, but you killed him. He's like, actually, I didn't kill him. And if you go back and you can actually see this in those Captain America and early, early Avengers issues, that Cap went after him alone. Uh, but uh, Zemo actually wound up killing himself. Uh, it was a, a rock slide and fell off a mountain and got buried. He wound up, and he, he expired. He he. He died. He perished. He got himself perished. A um, well, bunch of crow references here. <laughs> um, what do you call it? So, so he, Zemo's like, ah, I don't believe you. You're a liar. It's like, no, no. In fact, you're going to wind up getting jacked up in the exact same way. Well, a very similar way. And he winds up falling off a roof, gets himself jacked up. Yeah, that happened. <laughs> so, yeah, that was a hell of a battle. And eventually they have to wrap things up and whatnot. And in the future episodes, uh, well, well, the future issues, I should say, um, Jarvis is okay-ish, but he's got to deal with some post-traumatic stress of this. Um, more stuff going on with uh, Atlantis pretty soon. More than that, what happened in these issues also is that we find out that Hercules actually does have a heartbeat again, 
once every 10 minutes, his heart will do a single palpitation. Um, and then later on, you find out that somebody actually came in who looks an awful lot like Thor. I'm not saying anything. I'm just saying and kidnaps Hercules. This winds up turning into a huge thing. And this is basically the follow up of Siege. Uh, and I highly recommend reading those. Uh, in fact, it's called Assault on Olympus. Yes, the Avengers have to go up against the Greek gods. Because Zeus needs to blame somebody for the death of his son. But um, Olympians are true immortals. You can't actually kill an Olympian. It is said that on the plane of, of Olympus, a, um, uh, a god can be killed, but anywhere else cannot be killed. So, you know, now that uh, Hercules is going to be okay, He's brought back to Olympus in order to heal and be safe because he thinks that the Avengers either caused it or did it themselves or allowed it to happen, whatever. He, he's blaming some people, blaming some people. And it's really epic. A whole bunch of really cool stuff happens in there. I highly recommend reading those comic books for now, though. I definitely left a lot of stuff out of these comics. I, I mean, like, geez, I've been talking for about an hour now. I still left a whole lot out of these comics, but these are some of my favorite stories. They are effing amazing. I don't know how you could not like them. I'm just going to say that. Now, I'm also going to talk a little bit about uh, how stories were done then and how stories are done now. They're essentially the same thing, and they're kind of wrapped up a little bit better, a little bit more, you know, more of a bow put on them. Let's say you have the War of the Realms. Excuse me. Here's a completely separate event that happens, and there's a bunch of tie-in books. Well, that's kind of what's happening here, except there's no event book. All right. Eventually, you come across the, um, uh, the X-Men Inferno, where you'd have a huge actual because, like, you know, a bunch of story arcs and things like that would happen that would sometimes, you know, they'd be event level. They would cross over with other books or they would at least be tie ins with other books like here. They're the tie ins. West Coast Avengers issue number 16, uh, issue number 373 of Thor, issue number 383 of Spider-Man, whatever those books were, you know, go back to the beginning of this video and check them out. Um, but all of these stories, they were like, you know, oh, amazing, right? They were freaking amazing. But there was no single event book. It was just, they happened in the pages of the Avengers, or they happened in the pages of the, um, the X-Men, or they happened in the pages of whatever. There was always something happening. It was the main book. There wasn't an event series, which can feel really out of place. Um, yeah. <laughs> so when this crazy stuff, you know, when this crazy stuff was happening back then, you were already reading one of these books. If you weren't reading Avengers and you were reading Spider-Man, you're like, hey, if you want to know what's going on, why these are happening, you can always go and check out. Now, this is this is where my big issue is going to come from, so to speak. The editor's notes. You don't need an event comic book. You really don't need an event comic book. You could just have a regular comic book. You can have it in the regular pages of a book, just like back in the day, just like this, just like X-Men. Um, just like X-Men is going to be doing now with the uh, House of, uh, what do you call it, the Ten of Swords, right? Fifteen issues in the pages of all the different X-Men or Dawn of X comic books. There is no uh, Ten of Swords book, the X of Swords. There is no Ten of Swords book that, you know, oh, here's the main event and here's all the other stuff. This is the way that, it, in my opinion, should be. This is the way it was done in the past, and it worked really well. You always had those editor's notes that let you know, hey, you want to know why such and such happened? Feel free to go read this week's issue of you know, Amazing Spider-Man, which was issue number blah, 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 or next week's issue of the Fantastic Four. They also explain why the Fantastic Four didn't show up to help. You know what I'm saying? They were off planet, you know, and undercover and stuff like that. Anyway. Uh, they even tried to get a, uh, get to Black Panther at one point with their sunspots. So it was all explained, like continuity mattered. And while a lot of writers don't want to be involved in continuity, us readers are like, I don't care what you want. We want continuity. Sure, there's some people who don't care about it. There's some people who don't want it, period. I don't understand those people. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I genuinely don't. I have nothing against them, but I love continuity in my comic books it genuinely it's a great feeling and especially if there aren't too many comic books out you can buy all the comic books and you can literally see all the crossover and whatnot 
In the meantime, there are way too many comic books, and they only add to the number of comic books by making an event that also has tie-ins. Some that are ancillary, like you know, like the current um, um, uh, oh, for crying out loud, Iron Man 2020. The current Iron Man 2020, you know, as of the shooting of this video, is just in the Iron Man book, which I love. It's not like War of the Realms, you know, where it's like, oh, it's a separate event, you know, like Civil War. You know, it's 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 its own, you know, it's not its own separate event. It's happening within the pages of a comic book. I freaking love that. But it still has ancillary issues. Here's Machine Man, issue number one and two. Here's Rescue, issue number one. Here's, you know, all these different books that only exist for these couple of issues because they're going to, you know, reference back to stories that are happening in the pages of Iron Man uh, 2020. Mm, kind of frustrating, but whatever it is, what it is. If that's what you got to do, fine, that's what you got to do. But at least it, all those pages are right there, and they can always, you know, reference, hey, if you want to know how this happened, go and check out such and such book. So I dig what they're doing with Iron Man 2020, as opposed to making it an event book, even though it kind of feels like the whole thing is just there for the sake of being an event. Either way, here are the pages of the uh, Avengers, where there's actually an entire event happening, and instead of having ancillary issues, they actually have crossover appearances, crossover issues, where it's like, hey, if you want to know what Wrecker and, and Titania were doing, feel free to go over and check out this issue of Amazing Spider-Man. And then maybe if you weren't reading Spider-Man, maybe you'll continue reading Spider-Man because there's still a main story there, which is eventually going to lead into Ned Leeds and the Hobgoblin getting into it with each other and more members joining and coming after Spider-Man and it's like, didn't he just get finished beating Spider-Man recent or, or, or Hobgoblin recently? Why, yes, he did. And it's a really awesome story. And it might lead you to keep on reading it. Hey, if you weren't reading Thor before, you decided to go over and see what's going on here. What happened in the pages five through seven, five, six, and seven of uh, um, Thor issue number 383? Oh, wait a second. That's interesting. How'd that happen? Let's go to my comic book store, buy a couple of back issues. Hey, this is actually really good. Let's put, you know, Thor in my pull list. It's a reason to get people to look at other comic books and potentially pick up more comic books. The idea that they let editors notes go. And for the most part, it's an optional thing. Now I actually asked Miss Heather, Heather Antos about that. And she says, no, according to Marvel, it's, it's a completely optional thing that people can put in editors notes or not. I'm like, wow, that is genuinely a shame. That is a genuine freaking shame. Anyway. Um, I think that's a horrible idea. And editor's notes are the thing that allow you to follow up on a story and potentially buy other comic books. And I think it's just genius. But hey, what do I know? <laughs> anyway, guys, that is the Avengers Under Siege story. It's an amazing storyline. Uh, again, it's going to break into the Assault on Olympus. I highly recommend getting those also. Maybe I'll make a spot limit story on that. But I'm almost assuredly going to make a spotlight on story for the Mutant Massacre, the Morlock Massacre, because, wow, that is one of the greatest. That is literally my favorite freaking story arc ever. So expect that one day soon, hopefully. And I'm out. Professor Bill, Comic Book University. Make sure you check out the links below. Class dismissed.